Good morning, Maya. How are you doing? Good morning, Timothy. Fine, thank you. I hope that uh, all is good with you. Yes, so, I'm not on the deck of the good ship Santana, as you can see. Right. What happened? Well, I had I had obligations yesterday, and so I I didn't go out to uh, Katsuyama. So I'm I'm briefing from my home office. That's good to know. At least you're not out in uh, the wind and the cold, I believe. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, the introduction that uh, Richard Berger made for us. And okay. And the, the mic will be for you. Okay. Let's go. Yes, here we go. So thank you very much for waking up so early on Sunday morning. Timothy, to you and to everybody who is already in Clubhouse, everybody who is there and probably watching us uh, on YouTube and LinkedIn, you already know that uh, Timothy Langley is the CEO of Langley Squire. They specialize in consulting and pub policy, <laughs> policy consulting, am I right? I hope I am, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but uh, well, he has been here for a long, long time, over 40 years now. And uh, if you really need um, to get knowledge and advice and somebody to do the job for you, you know who to uh, turn to. That's Timothy Langley and his team here in Japan. So Timothy, without any further ado, I'm giving you the mic and the floor and everything else because I believe that uh, you have a lot of things to tell us about. Here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya, and good morning to everybody. Welcome to Japanese Politics One on One. Maya, this is episode 90. 90 it is, yes. 90. So today is October 30th. Um, we give you uh, insight into what's going on in Japanese politics on a weekly running basis. We met last time, uh, seven days ago, talking about the yen, talking about what was going on in, in London, what's going on with the prime minister. And we have plenty to update you with uh, this week. Uh, before I start, though, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us again. Uh, my business is public policy and government affairs. Uh, so we don't do everything. But, um, you know, as a, as a consequence of, of foreign companies and embassies and chambers of commerce doing business here, uh, frequently they run into issues that require really high level uh, deft touch with, um, with the Japanese government. And that's what my uh, company uh, specializes in. And as a consequence of that, I've been doing it for a long time, as, as Maya pointed out. Um, I'm able to give this briefing um, somewhat off the cuff, but it is, it's, uh, you know, for um, Clubhouse, it's for uh, LinkedIn, just to, to update you. And I hope it's, um, it, it whets your appetite and uh, keeps you up to speed with what's going on. Before I start, uh, getting into it, there was a, uh, a very uh, huge disaster in South Korea last night during Halloween um, exuberance. About 150 kids were uh, killed, were trampled in, um, in the capital city. Uh, there was a, um, a, a rush uh, of people. It, it was li something like Shibuya. Um, and uh, uh, today they're picking up the pieces. But at this point, 150 um, uh, South Koreans have and, and foreigners too have died in, in that uh, melee. So um, our, our deepest uh, you know, respect and regrets go to uh, the South Koreans as they um, get through this very difficult period. So um, uh, with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about Japanese politics. When we talk about Japanese politics, obviously we talk about the prime minister given the hierarchical structure of Japanese politics and all things um, kind of begin with the prime minister. This week, you have not heard uh, much about uh, his approval ratings because these these polls come out maybe every uh, three weeks or four weeks. Uh, the last one came out, he looked really bad in the low 30s, um, maybe the high 20s. Um, and this is an indication of uh, the appreciation of the Japanese uh, population and also people within 
his ruling party within the LDP who are expressing dissatisfaction with him. Um, and it indicates not, not a kind of a lame duck uh, situation for him, but an inability for him to move policies and to assert, you know, his, his domain over certain uh, issues that are important to him. He came out of being um, the longest serving foreign minister, as you know, under the Abe administration. There was a brief hiatus with Mr. Sugita, uh, Sugita um, uh, Suga, Suga as, as prime minister, then the election, and um, he became prime minister as a result of that. We all remember that. Uh, about uh, five months ago, there was an election for um, uh, the upper house. Uh, he did extremely well there. But as a consequence of that election, uh, former prime minister uh, Shinzo Abe was assassinated. And then this, this Pandora's box of what's going on with the unification church and how ha have they kind of infiltrated and ingratiated themselves into politics. And I think the model that they were following was uh, Sokagakai and the formation of the Komeito political party. And I think this was a, a model that they were using you know, collecting funds from uh, uh, people who were believers. They had a huge following here. They had a huge following in the United States, still do. Uh, but this scandal has really gone deeply into Japanese politics and has uh, really hurt the prime minister. So uh, one of the biggest reasons for his popularity is this um, revelation that the Unification Church has had uh, ongoing relations with many members of the LDP and not just the LDP, but predominantly the LDP. And within the LDP, uh, within Mr. Abe's uh, political faction, uh, which is still going through a little bit of turmoil now, there's some news on that I'd like to uh, uh, fill you in on. But for the time being, talking about the Unification Church and the, the damage it's done to the prime minister. The second thing that brought his ratings down, you're not hearing much about that now, is his, it wasn't a snap decision, but people call it a, a rather hasty decision to have a state funeral for the slain prime minister. I think that has gone by the wayside now. We've talked about that. We've talked about how much it costs. He's taken the bullet for that. Sorry for that um, um, uh, choice of words, but he's taken the hit for um, making that decision and spending that um, amount of money. Uh, he got a little bit of a boost out of it, uh, but I think on par, it was probably a negative form. But the lingering effects now of the Unification Church just continue to tumble. This last week, uh, speaking about Japanese politics that's important um, in, on a weekly basis, his uh, economic revitalization minister, uh, Daisho Yamagiwa, from the lower house in the district of uh, Kawasaki. Actually, he's in my election district. He is the House of Representatives uh member for the area where I live, um, he had to resign. Um, and this was this this happened on Tuesday. So the diet went back into session on Monday. Uh, they're meeting every day. It's a one it's a 69 day diet session. It's an extraordinary diet session. It will end on December 10th. And um, Mr. Hagiuda, who is the policy affairs uh, chief within the LDP, very powerful fellow, also within the um, Abe faction, Sewakai, um, said he wanted to pass at least 18 bills. They haven't even addressed those because of the Unification Church and the, um, the Abe uh, state funeral um, discussions. So on Monday, they, uh, the, the Diet came in uh, to the, uh, the budget hearings, and all of the discussions were about you know, the Unification Church and Mr. Yamagiwa's um, inability to explain what he had been doing and how much um, involvement he has had with the Unification Church. And there are a lot of people that are digging in that, uh, pulling out uh, photographs of him in various um, places, making speeches on behalf of the organization and meeting, in fact, with the chairman. Um, and when he's quizzed about that uh, this last week, not, not this just immediate past week, the week before that, his explanations really left a lot of people scratching their heads. So people were angry. They came, um, you know, fit for, for blood on Monday, and it really dominated the conversations. They couldn't get anything else done. 
And um, the opposition party insisted to the prime minister, you know, in, unless you get rid of this guy, um, we're not going to move forward on other uh, important diet matters. So the it was really put to him harshly. But he said on on Tuesday, I stand by him. He is my uh, my minister. He's in my cabinet. I had him vetted. The fact that he can't explain some of these things, he doesn't remember. Him. He doesn't have the the records for that. I take him at his word. When I told you I was going to reshuffle the cabinet so that we could expunge the influence of the Unification Church, I meant that and I stand by it. And less than eight hours later, he um, actually, uh, Mr. Yamagiwa resigned. I think he was fired by the prime minister. The story is that Mr. Yamagiwa resigned. The complications here are several fold. One is uh, this is the first person to be re removed from the cabinet or to remove himself from the cabinet since it was formed less than three months ago. Secondly, uh, Mr. Yamagiwa is in the ASO faction. When you look at the factional dynamics, factional, di uh, factional politics rules what the LDP does. Mr. Kishida is the leader of the third largest faction. The first largest faction um, is the Abe faction, Sewa Ken, um, led by a coalition of several members. They're still trying to figure out who is going to be the leader there. The second largest faction is Mr. Aso's faction. He picked up two members about three weeks ago. So um, he's, he's getting a little bit stronger. The third one is Motegi. I'm sorry, uh, I, I misspoke. The third one is Mr. Motegi, who is the secretary general of the LDP. And then the fourth largest one is Mr. Kishida's. So he's he's a little bit on, on, on his back heel dealing with that. But with Mr. Yamagiwa resigning, um, there's there's that dynamic. So um, he appointed uh, Shigeru Goto, a, a really fabulous politician, uh, Brown University, um, a master's in economic policy, uh, very uh, affable. Um, I've, I've been a, a member of his Benkyo Kai for maybe 12 years. Um, you might remember him on, on TV. He's always got a very bright smile, like um, he's got the uh, the canary in his mouth. Um, but he's he's uh, really a, a astute politician. He was Minister of Health in the previous administration. Um, during the cabinet reshuffle, he was taken out, not because of Unification Church, but he was just taken out. I think maybe they wanted room for somebody else. And now with the, the resignation of Mr. Yamagiwa, Mr. Goto steps in. And I think that will be really good. Economic revitalization, that is the portfolio. And because Mr. Yamagiwa was so under the gun and being questioned about his, his connections with the Unification Church, it's really difficult to um, comprehend how much he was able to devote to actually moving the economic policies forward. This prime minister is basically, his specialization is in foreign policy, long, longest serving uh, foreign minister. So you would expect that. He's not a, a finance kind of guy. He's not an economic policy kind of individual. So he does need that support from others. Um, and uh, the fact that really uh, a lot of pronouncements have been made about, you know, the startup economy, about, uh, you know, how to double income, what the new capitalism means are, are very um, lacking in details. There's a lot of talk going on there. But to have Mr. Yamagiwa, you know, fighting a, a rear guard battle at the same time, I think that maybe explains why there has been so little um, uh, movement going on there. Now we are in a extraordinary diet session and they they really need to, to kick ass if they're going to produce something that re resonates with the public. So that's, that's what Mr. Goto's um, mandate is. He's um, been working on it now for, for five days. Um, and I think that's a supplemental budget. They didn't pass it. They, um, the, the cabinet adopted a supplemental budget, which they will uh, pass through to vote on, a huge uh, supplemental budget. But in the meantime, uh, Mr. Goto has his work cut out from him. And I think you can expect to hear other things coming from uh, that quadrant of the, uh, the administration in short order, probably within a couple of weeks. But the diet session for 69 days, they're already saying, we just, you know, we can't do all of the things that we need to do. We're ending on December 10th. Maybe we need to extend that. 
if they extend it, it, it can only really go to the end of Jan, uh, December, because in January, probably around January 10th, they will have the regular uh, diet session, which is uh, written in the Constitution, 160 days, uh, where the diet meets annually. Every other session after that is either a special or an extraordinary session. Doesn't have to be held. Uh, depends on what the prime minister um, wants to do, what the economy is doing, what the opposition party insists on. But the current um, extraordinary session was triggered by uh, the opposition party telling the prime minister, you need to explain the unification church and you need to explain what this is with the, the Abbey funeral. He hemmed and he hawed for a little bit. And then he said, OK, I will start. I, I will give you time to talk about that, to quiz me, to quiz uh, people in my cabinet about these issues that are concerning you. And I will launch an extraordinary diet session. So he kind of started this ball going. And he also is responsible for putting Mr. Yamagiwa on his cabinet. So a lot of people are um, pointing fingers at him and saying, look, you know, you appointed him. You knew that he had um, ties to the Unification Church, even though you might not have known how deep it was. But he was your choice. And even under the scrutiny of Bunshun and several of the other um, uh, reporters, you didn't ask him to resign. You didn't ask, you know, it just snowballed and snowballed until it stopped diet proceedings. You're the bad guy here. So uh, this last week, he is a, a bit under the gun. Um, we won't expect to hear a poll number for another two weeks, but a lot can happen in two weeks. They, The diet um, uh, accepted the proposal from the... Uh, from the administration for a really astounding uh, supplemental budget. It is, um, uh, let me see, where did I have that? Uh, the economic stimulus package. So they've passed an economic stimulus package that is just astounding. Uh, and they've done it within this fractious period. Um, they've been in the diet for about three weeks, four weeks. One week they were uh, kind of on vacation, kind of on hiatus as the Minister of Finance was in Washington, D.C., talking about the yen, talking about economic policy. He came back two weeks ago, and then things have been really robust then. But that what they did was they passed a 39 trillion yen budget. In U.S. dollars terms, that's $264 billion to supplement the budget between now and April 1st. So that's, you know, you scratch your head, it's, it's just... 264 followed by a whole string of zeros. It's it's hard to comprehend. Um, the reason for this kind of a budget is because the GDP, the amount of growth of the, the, the uh, economy is being hammered and it is decreased by about 15 trillion yen. And in order to keep the economy going without it collapsing, the government has to come in and supplement that so that the economy keeps on going, but just 15 isn't going to do it far, far more than that. Um, it, it was 15 uh, billion that they needed. That's the shortfall. So they doubled that almost uh, to uh, 39 trillion. So I think you're gonna see um, signs of the economy picking up um, uh, a little bit. And they also you know, uh, intervened with the yen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because that's pretty critical too. But what's happening now with the supplemental budget is they're going to um, uh, reduce, artificially reduce the cost of energy for heating, for electricity starting in January. Everybody who has a heating bill or an electricity bill, it will be, th that bill will be reduced by 5,000 yen um, per month. Uh, that starts in January um, and it's nationwide. Um, in addition to that, uh, women who are pregnant or who are thinking of being pregnant or who ha recently had uh, children are going to get a, a boost, whether they're married or non-married. Um, uh, families who are in a, a kind of economic, economically depressed uh, situation will receive a, uh, a funding, a cash funding of uh, 100,000 yen. That's about, how much is that? That's uh, a Jumayan, maybe $10,000. Um, and no, that's not ten thousand dollars, is it, Maya? Jumayan, that's 
Well, it's uh, sorry, it's much less than uh, ten thousand dollars. No, it's uh, Juman yen is uh, one thousand dollars if you if you calculate it one to one, right, to the dollar. Right. But it's probably much less than that now because, uh, of, because uh, right. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I'm, my my mind is always in on Japanese yen. It's hard to to calculate that, but yeah, for some indeed. people, it's easier to understand it in U.S. dollar terms. Yeah. So this isn't a huge bo boost, a huge shot in the arm for people who are suffering, but it is something that the prime minister can do on his own accord. He can generate that and push that through. He's not going to get much opposition from Cometo. In fact, Cometo is clamoring for far more than uh, 100,000. So he, he was able to uh, accommodate them. The opposition parties uh, don't like the government just handing out cash because it, it's just like candy. It's it evaporates once it, it hits the payment, the pavement. So, um, but it does generate some good feelings toward the administration, free money, uh, but it's it's not a long-term policy um, uh, imperative because it just, it just is spending money. It doesn't do anything for the economy. So um, this is supposed to, this economic package is supposed to push inflation down about 1.2 percentage points. So. Currently, they're they're scratching three percent, maybe uh, three point two percent right now. It's higher than what the Bank of Japan wants at two percent. So what they've said, they've used a um, a word that has been famously used in the United States. This is transitory. It's not permanent. We've kind of overshot it. We have higher prices because of of Ukraine, because of energy costs, because of the high dollar. Um, separate from the yen, but the, the dollar is, is extremely strong too, even if the yen stayed at par, which it didn't. Um, uh, the, the economy requires um, uh, that. And for the Bank of Japan, uh, they say that inflation is, is a necessary component of reviving the Japanese economy. In the meantime, prices continue to increase, uh, commodity prices and consumer prices. And so the, the economic uh, package, the stimulus package is to supposed to bring that down. Let's see what that happens. I think it will have an, an impact uh, because that's an awful lot of money. Um, moving on to the uh, the yen and the, the money there. So the last time that we talked, the Bank of Japan, we believe, intervened after close of business on a Friday. The yen was scratching. It was above 150, maybe 150 yen to the dollar. At the close of uh, it was lower than that at the close of business in Tokyo. Markets in uh, New York uh, treated it a little bit more roughly. The dollar edged up past 150 uh, towards 151. And then there was some intervention. And the details, when we had our briefing last week, uh, we didn't have the details on that. But those details have come out. And I'd like to share them with you because they're, they're pretty interesting. And because we talked about it last week, um, and it's, uh, I, I, I wasn't able to address it. So now I've got the details and it looks like Japan spent a record of uh, 5.4 trillion to 5.5 trillion yen. That is in US dollar terms, about 36 billion to 36, um, 37 billion yen, uh, dollars in propping up the yen. So this was something that was done overnight. That vast amount of money was went in to purchase yen, lifted the price up. And um, in fact, it did have its desired effect on Monday of this last week, uh, six days ago, uh, the currency came down to 148. So it did have an impact um, about uh, maybe five yen, which is rather dramatic, but it's gone back up as, I guess analysts had anticipated and inspected uh, because the, the the economic factors dictating what the the level of the the yen is is um, it's not dictated here in Japan. It's not dictated by how much money the Japanese government spends to prop it up. Um, it really depends a lot on what's going on with uh, the U.S. dollar, with the Federal Reserve, with the interest rates that are going on there. They have hiked the interest rate in three consecutive moves, I think almost monthly, by 0.75. And uh, this is unprecedented. 
So the Japanese yen is suffering from that because they are not in lockstep with other G G6, G7 countries, uh, G20 countries, in fact, um, and, and is trying to keep a loose monetary policy and keep the yen um, floating. So uh, there is um, good points to that, as the prime minister likes to point out, and there are bad points, which he likes to avoid. The good points are that, boy, Japan sure is a bargain. So tourists, please come. There is something to be said for that as an act of tourism, not only internal tourism of Japanese traveling to other um, prefectures or e even within the prefectures, but for foreigners coming in, there is a huge pent up demand and it, it acts as an act of to to trigger the economy. Um, maybe uh, as we, well, maybe now, in fact, Maya, we can talk a little bit about um, what kind of news or information um, has hit your radar on how tourism is building over this last week. You might remember when we talked about it a week ago, you actually um, uh, spoke for about five minutes on, on uh, what the dollar was doing, what the, the tourism was doing as I was falling off the boat. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit more today? Yes, once again, um, well, basically a lot of people seem to be willing to come to Japan and uh, the predictions uh, by some that, uh, you know, those who were really waiting for uh, the border openings to come, uh, they would give up and so on, uh, turned to be untrue. And so there is an influx of um, Western and some Asian tourists now into the country. The thing is, though, that uh, there is, uh, we have the bottleneck of um, well, very few uh, flights uh, as compared to the number of flights before uh, the pandemic started. So a lot of uh, low cost carriers are not flying yet, which means that uh, once again, there aren't enough available um, seats airplane seats and uh, another thing uh, of course to that is that uh, the prices of the tickets are still relatively high so um, well we are going to see of course uh, a return of uh, the foreign visitors to japan but it's going to take a little bit until the the airlines catch up with the number of seats and also with uh, the prices so that's what i can say for the moment and uh, well the floor is yours once again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya. And I think people who are on this call, definitely, I mean, Maya, you've noticed it too. We've talked about it uh, in the past, the number of, of tourists here in town. Yesterday was Saturday, Friday and Saturday. I drive through uh, Shibuya on my way home. Uh, Friday was pretty wild. Saturday was was unbelievable. Everybody and, and their their ghost was out on Saturday night. Um, Shibuya was totally packed, but lots of foreigners. So I, I guess there's a vibe internationally that uh, to, uh, Shibuya for Halloween is a real party. Yes, there is a vibe and uh, a lot of this information is actually published uh, in uh, not only guidebooks, but also in uh, the press overseas and uh, of course here in Japan as well. So Yes, it is also delivered by <laughs> guides, you know, and uh, travel agencies uh, that accept uh, foreign tourists. So, yes, it is uh, a big thing now in but, Japan. But it's funny that you would comment that um, the flow of tourists would be far greater if the flights were more numerous. Yes, indeed. And, uh, well, a lot of people uh, who work here in the travel industry, they expect that the number of tourists will uh, return to the levels uh, before the pandemic, uh, probably in uh, 2024. So, uh, because, well, it takes time, you know, the logistics um, of uh, the airlines and everything, so it takes time, obviously for them to come back. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Hopefully uh, they will, you know, we will see that return sooner than uh, 2024, but that's what it is at the okay, moment. Okay, thank you. So uh, moving on to another topic, if you don't mind, Maya, uh, getting back to the unification, thank you. Getting back to the unification church. So one of the, the discussions being had this last week was, um, uh, pretty much motored by the opposition party. And essentially their voice was, we need to disband the Unification Church. It is so grossly intertwined with the LDP, LDP politics, with the um, former Abe 
um, Shinzo faction, the existing uh, Sewakai. Um, even the Speaker of the House has had uh, ties with that. We need to disp- we need to dissolve this this organization. And the prime minister and his administration is backpedaling a little bit. They don't want to go that far. Their excuse is that it could be viewed as discriminatory. It could be viewed as a violation of of the Constitution, church and state, uh, the tax benefits that this organization receives as a uh, registered church. Um, The suspicion is that, yeah, he's he and his administration have already been committed to the Unification Church, and maybe there's um, the back channel um, uh, conversations that, yes, you are suffering now. We will protect you. You will still be in existence. We appreciate what you've done for the LDP and for me personally and for my political faction over the last 40 years or 50 years. Um, so we will we will be handling this. That that sense kind of comes up because of this, this uh, dichotomy. Really hard. Let's dissolve the bastards. And the other one, you know, let's just, you know, let's look at the law and apply the law fairly. There have been some mistakes. Let's have a commission on who are the victims and then force the Unification Church to uh, recompensate those victims and do those other things. So there's a real battle going on there. And um, at the same time, you know, this is Japan, Japan politics and scandals. They go hand in hand. There was... um, uh, a circulation that there was a document that was produced by the Unification Church to give to various members of the LDP, me- various members of the parliament to sign. And if you sign this document, it's got four precepts to it. If you sign this document, you can depend on the Unification Church um, for uh, uh, providing you help and assistance, uh, monetary um, you know, contributions, that sort of thing. But we want you to sign this document. So this this revelation came out, um, uh, smoke of it came out about two weeks ago. This last week, it, it came out uh, pretty hard. And there are members within the administration, within the cabinet, who have signed that document. So they are under um, real heat um, to, uh, to explain themselves and also to distance themselves. You might remember that as part of the investigation initiated by Mr. Kishida, he gave it to Mr. Motegi. He said, I want all of the members of the LDP to uh, reveal what their relationship is with the Unification Church on one page. And I want them to sign a statement that they're not going to have anything to do with it. Not everybody, I mean, everybody um, at the the risk of of being ejected from the LDP, everybody submitted that except for um, the prime minister and except for uh, the speaker of the house. It was deemed that they are in a different class than regular LDP members. Uh, So they were removed from that. It caused a big brouhaha. And then they had to actually come in. The Speaker of the House had to produce his response, which went on for almost three pages. So uh, there is involvement there. It's hard to uh, deny it. It's hard to cover it up. Um, And uh, one of the uh, ministers said, you know, I, I did sign the document, but I have no intention of of backtracking it from it, you know, I'm in my position now because of the support I received from the Unification Church. So uh, there, the opposition is saying, you know, he must resign. He's he's a bad person for doing that. He's, um, uh, you know, going contrary to uh, public policy. And so that fight is going on now, too. Similarly, um, other scandals are are coming up. You're not hearing much about that now. They're kind of cooking They might spring forward. Um, One of the uh, members of the cabinet in a vice ministerial role um, had a um, he's actually with the um, uh, the ethics committee um, uh, said that um, his accounting was done by uh, somebody on his uh, support group. And this individual has been reported as uh, dead several years. So uh, that's causing a lot of concern because. Who is watching the money that you are collecting on your um, your uh, uh, political campaigns? It's a dead person. And um, so what's going on there? That's really um, pretty harsh. It's, it's hard to deny that. There are three others, uh, members of the LDP, that are uh, undergoing a terrific scrutiny, all at the minister or the vice minister level. Um, one is um, uh, a, a young 
diet member, uh, lower house. Um, her name is um, Mio Sugita. And she's been questioned about comments that she's had about um, uh, LGBT and people of, of, of that kind of persuasion, very negative. And one of the precepts that you're supposed to sign with this unification church is backtrack on uh, LGBT, you know, push it down, don't make any progress there. And her stance um, is um, really a, a good representation of having made that commitment. So she's being a little bit weaselly, um, according to uh, the opposition parties. She's under the hot seat. And then there, uh, there are two others that I think um, might deserve a little bit more attention this next week, should it cook up. But right now it's... Um, it's just a, a real headache for the prime minister. This next week will be critical. Um, we talk about Mr. Abe, uh, his unfortunate assassination, and the fact that he was the leader of the largest political faction, 98 members. The second largest is the Aso faction with about 50, 58 members right now. Uh, so that's a huge uh, gap. I mean, between number one and number two, it's huge. Um, and uh, absent his leadership, there is a coalition of about four um, prominent Sewakai members who are guiding that. Um, there is a, uh, a movement afoot for uh, Akie Abe to actually be involved. She's already said at the funeral, right after the funeral, because this issue came up, why don't you step in and be the leader of the Sewakan, that would really help us because we don't have a leader. We don't have somebody who has the, the, um, um, the personality and also the personal connections. Personal connections in in this country can be passed down from father to son or from father uh, from husband to wife. Sometimes to your um, diet secretary, it has happened. But when there's a familiar relationship, it is um, much easier to do that. So this was the push, and she said, "No, I'm not going to do it." So this, the next issue that has come up is that his seat now in Yamaguchi number four is now open. They must have a by-election before April. And they're saying, why don't you run? And she is, you know, she's a astute person, although a lot of people say, you know, she's a little bit of an airhead. I don't think so. But she said, I'm not that stupid because Yamaguchi number four is one of the prefectures where they're going to lose a diet seat so that the large prefectures like Chiba, uh, Tokyo, Kanagawa can increase it. So it's called the 1010. That, um, that policy was insisted on by the Supreme Court. You might remember we talked about this last week and adopted by the administration last week. So definitely in the next election, they will gerrymander, they will redistribute. But for this next election, the by-election in Yamaguchi, the old rules apply. So the, the thinking is maybe uh, Akie could, could come in, she would easily take over her, uh, her husband's position, but in the next election after that, and maybe as a consequence, you know, uh, help run Sewakai, which she's said she, she really is not interested in. But in any event, once there's a new election, uh, which is not scheduled for another two and a half years for the lower house, um, the new gerrymandering rules will occur and in Yamaguchi, somebody's got to go. And in that prefecture, um, the LDP is required to endorse one candidate for, for those, those positions. So that would mean that Miss uh, Abe, Akie Abe, would be um, in a competition with the current foreign minister who is actually far more popular in that prefecture than Mr. Abe ever was, even though he was prime minister, even though he came from that district. Um, the, the um, Hayashi uh, family, the Hayashi dynasty is much richer, much deeper, much more popular in that district. So the LDP would have a hard time uh, selecting who's going to be their champion in Yamaguchi. So it's a, it's a real complicating factor. I don't think that uh, the uh, wife of the former prime minister will jump at that. Sewakai is still in the lurch. We don't know what that leadership is going to look like. Um, we know who the potential candidates are for Yamaguchi in that by-election, um, uh, relatives of the former prime minister or his uh, his number one diet secretary 
in that district will be candidates. Uh, a lot to be seen there. And there's a lot of time before that too. But it, it is an interesting insight into what's going on. And uh, just discussing it requires a little bit of familiariz familiarization with you know, the 1010, the Supreme Court holding and that sort of thing. So I don't want to belabor it, but if you have questions about it, if it's complicated or if you're really interested in it, maybe when we finish this briefing and go exclusively to uh, Clubhouse, uh, that's our, our Q&A session. Uh, you can weigh in there. I'd like to move on to defense. Um, as you re will remember this, this time last week, the prime minister had just returned from three days in Australia. This is the uh, fourth face-to-face -face meeting that the prime minister has had with the, uh, the uh, prime minister of Australia face-to-face -face in Perth. They went to Perth um, because that is really the center of a lot of the uh, wheat that is generated for uh, importation to Japan and also LNG, which is heavily, uh, Japan is heavily reliant on Australia for LNG. They went there for a bunch of reasons, not just business and economy, but um, you know, prominently for defense. So you know uh, the SOFA agreement between the United States and Japan, the uh, self, um, self defense forces and the United States collaboration. It's enshrined in an agreement uh, that was signed in, I think, 1972, caused huge riots in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo University was a war zone. They passed that legislation and the United States and Japan has, has been um, working under that. And that's why Okinawa appears to be just a, a, a perennial problem because of U.S. bases that are, uh, or forces that are based there, according to this agreement. Japan and Australia doesn't have that kind of an agreement. In fact, they're not even considered allies. They have a strategic relationship, but um, even in, in public comments, they don't call each other allies. The United States and Japan clearly are allies. Um, but this movement to um, uh, coalesce a little bit tighter, the defense capabilities uh, is uh, really remarkable in this last trip. So they came back and uh, more press is being um, released on what they decided there. One of the th critical things that they uh, decided was that uh, Japanese forces can go to Australia and train with Australian forces. And similarly, Australian forces can now come to Japan and train with Japanese forces on Japanese soil. Th there, there is no other agreement like that except for the United States and Japan. And this is another indication of the just the incredible rapid change that is going on geopolitically and also uh, in Japan to account for what's going on geopolitically. What's going on uh, with China and Taiwan, with Ukraine, with North Korea, um, all of these, these aspects of geopolitics are really weighing down and uh, really inciting the United States to take a very firm, very aggressive stance and cobbling together this, this force of like-minded countries like South Korea, um, India, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, to have a, a bulwark against uh, potential incursions or more aggressive stance uh, from China with regard to Taiwan. With the elections, the elections or the, um, the council that was had in China just this last week um, and uh, the prominence and the kind of unquestioned uh, uh, position of uh, Chairman Xi, uh, it looks like they're could be a roadmap for um, aggressive, uh, you know, kinetic um, action going on in that area. So you can see that the Japanese are really moving forward. They're moving forward with Australia. This is a significant agreement that they had, not just with LNG, not just with food sources, but also defense. And similarly with uh, South Korea, this last week was um, quiet. There were no missile firings from North Korea. But already um, there is great anticipation that they are going to have their seventh nuclear test to show everybody that they are a nuclear power. And in fact, I think, um, I think it's true. They are a nuclear power and um, uh, people need to act accordingly. And they're just going to continue to be uh, blustering. The prime minister has said he's going to fix that problem. This last week, he said he's going to address the North Korea problem. He opens his doors, no preconditions for meeting with uh, our great leader. And I think there might be some, some movement there. This is an overture that we haven't heard in a long time. Um, 
also the uh, the families of the kidnapped um, Japanese who have gone to Japan or gone to North Korea, um, they are really clamoring for more action there. So that has been in the news. And I know it weighs on the prime minister. He would like to get some traction there. He's really sinking in the polls. He's got to pull a rabbit out of the, the hat. Part of that can be with the, the economy. Part of that can be with defense. He's already said, the defense minister has said, we don't have enough defensive missiles to shoot down um, offensive uh, incoming. Uh, we're, we're about 60% short. We need to buy more missiles, more Patriots, more uh, cruise missiles, more of the Aegis system. Uh, this is expensive stuff. And it also explains why the, the government has promoted going from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP on defense spending. That is being considered now. It will be, um, uh, the budgets are being um, hammered out. They will be submitted to the diet and passed into the new budget on April. So there's a lot of action going on here. And as you might recall, when the defense agency and the various ministries that are related to defense were told to form their budget. They said, don't, they were told, they were instructed, don't um, be reluctant because of the figures that are attached to this, the things that you want, the, the products or the services or the, the systems that you anticipate Japan needing. Leave the money figure out, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that later, but just tell us, you know, what is the strategy? How does it work together? And the numbers will come up after that. So um, in light of that, there was a question last week about, um, aren't the U.S. Uh, defense contractors taking advantage of that and kicking up the, the prices because they know that the Japanese need these, um, these systems. They must rely on the United States because they just don't have a defense industry in Japan. They're trying to do that, um, not, not very successfully. Uh, you might remember there, one of the things the Japanese are really good at is submarines. Uh, they tried to sell some submarines, uh, six submarines, a si submarine system to Australia about four years ago, five years ago, they lost to the French and that was really too bad. But um, Japan and Australia, they're, they're continuing to grow uh, tighter and closer together. I think had that um, submarine deal uh, been these days, probably it would have gone to the Japanese because ultimately I believe that uh, that decision was, was made on a, on a political basis, not an economic one. Um, anyway, uh, Japan is, um, uh, beefing up its long-term security and uh, its short-term security. The Prime Minister of Australia and Japan made uh, comments. They signed agreements um, and, and a joint statement that specifically dealt with the long-term and the short-term. So I think uh, you'll be seeing a little bit more of that. Interestingly enough, you know, um, South Korea and Japan have had a really rough relationship. Uh, every three years, there is a joint naval exercise in Sagami Bay. There's Tokyo Bay and the next bay south is Sagami Bay. It's a huge bay. If you took um, um, Mount Fuji and turned it upside down and put it into Sagami Bay, it would sink. It is that deep. It is a huge bay. They'll be doing naval exercises there. And for the first time in about eight years, the South Koreans will send a, a complement of uh, naval destroyers to participate. One of the sticking points there is that uh, Japan's Navy flies the rising sun. The emblem um, of, of the Navy is the rising sun flag, the one with all of the spokes coming out of it. Um, and that is uh, um, criticized. It is uh, considered to be an aggressive stance by the Japanese whenever they see that flag because of the colonial era, because of the wartime period, which was the flag that was uh, most prominently flown. And they've insisted that the Japanese just have the, the round uh, red rising sun and a white background as their, their flag. And that has been refused. So there is some progress being made. And I think the prime minister is moving um, aggressively to solve that. The other issue that um, has come up is, you know, Mitsubishi Heavy and Mitsui uh, Mining, their assets were frozen. They were seized by the Korean government to pay for wartime um, reparations for all of the people that were harmed by uh, Japan's occupation. Um, that has caused a, a rift between Japan and South Korea. The Supreme Court is supposed to rule on that, but in the meantime, it looks like um, the prime minister, the new prime minister of South Korea has said, we are going to take care of that payment 
there is a Japan, a, a South Korean fund that will be taking care of these payments. And maybe the Japanese, if you guys want to contribute, you can. But the Japanese in a, um, you know, they're, they're just not going to do that. They've already made an agreement. They've already earmarked money uh, for that. That was done uh, 20 years ago. They're not going back on that. But I think to break that log jam, the uh, prime minister is going to um, uh, make some concessions there. It might come out of the uh, South Korean budget. But I think with that area solved, it won't completely relinquish what people feel in South Korea about the responsibility of the Japanese. But maybe it will be a salve on that wound. We've just got to move forward on it. And the United States is is really, um, really uh, eager to do that. Uh, Ghana, interestingly, is receiving small-scale nuclear reactors um, at the, um, the kindness of the United States and Japan. These small reactors are um, uh, 30 times smaller than the, the regular uh, reactors that take 20 years to build. These are built by components. They produce uh, far less energy, but they're mobile. They are um, uh, small. They're safer and they're easier to cool down. Ghana, interestingly, is going to be the uh, the test base for that. So it's pretty big news. These smaller reactors, it's a test case. Can we go from the larger ones that were destroyed like in Fukushima into the smaller ones where we can distribute them throughout the uh, the country? And not just you know for Japan, but particularly for Japan, but also in, in other countries of the world, Ghana has gotten that, uh, that um, benefit. And they'll be going to that. So the only other thing is that um, this week we will have a um, uh, a visit, a state visit from the German president, uh, Frank Walter Steimer. He will be here for three days and then he and his wife will go to South Korea. So this kind of march of, of bringing this coalition of, of uh, interested parties together, not just military, diplomatic, but a state visit from um, uh, the German uh, president is is a pretty big deal. You will see flags flying if you're in Tokyo uh, from the um, from the the post, the Japanese flag and the the German flag flying at um, uh, you know regular intersections and throughout the city, maybe even on buses. Um, because uh, a visit by uh, the president, it is a state visit. He will meet with the the emperor and the empress, um, and then from there go on to South Korea. Maya, I think that's about it for the hot topics. There are other things that are going on we can get into in our question and answer period, but I hope this has covered most of the hot topics. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned because there's a, a ebb and a flow to what we, we do here. And sometimes you need to be um, kind of versatile from week to week because the issues just don't go away. They just get richer. Sometimes they get resolved. Sometimes they become um, real uh, lightning flashes. But uh, I really appreciate you tuning in every week, and um, both Maya and I are dedicated to giving you the, the hottest, latest, the most uh, um, accurate news succinctly as, as succinctly as possible. Maya? Very much so, indeed. So thank you, Timothy. Uh, I'll let you go now just for 30 seconds so that uh, you can jump into the clubhouse room and we can continue there. Okay. So thank you. And, uh, Please just stay there for a few more seconds until I finish the live stream. Okay. Uh, Maya, by the way, your costume looks great. Costume? Oh, yes, I know that. So, and I can say that your imagination is really supreme. Yes. Okay. So, see you on the other side. Okay. Take thanks. Don't fall off board. <laughs>